started me on this road was I was missing something in fashion. I was missing something that inspired me at the very beginning, and that was emotion. Um, so much is actually stitched into the clothes um, that what you collect around you is almost like a library. It's almost like a forest where each ring in every tree tells its story. And we wanted, you know, the idea for this project was really to bring this voyage through cloth to life along a route map of emotional flashpoints. So we called it Les Cartes de Tendresse, which is the emotional maps. And really, Nick said to me, okay, to start the ball rolling, I want you to write me some notes, just like, like writing mood boards. So um, we, we called them flashpoints, and we decided that along this, this road, this voyage through cloth, my collection of clothes, there were these points of meaning, if you like, epiphanies, thing, moments that meant a lot to me, which were invested in the choices of what I wore. And what we, began, what we realized was, that, was why I collected the things that I have collected was because the meaning was not only about the time and space that I occupied with those clothes at that time, but also the importance of memory and experience. So that actually there's a whole story, there's a voice in every single dress, every single coat, every shoe, every hat, everything. And so our idea is to bring it to life, but to bring it to life in a way that defies film, really to make you smell the clothes, to make you feel every stitch, to understand the inside, to understand the making, the rhythm, the dance of what was happening, what happened, what might still happen with each thing. And that became a really exciting idea. It's almost like synesthesia in film. Can we do it? So to this end, I started writing my mood boards for Nick because um, I, I didn't really know how to write a film treatment and it seemed something that, I don't know, resonated with me. I felt, I felt, I felt it, it had an honesty and the whole thing about this is an honesty. Everybody's collection, you know, I sort of believe that all of us are the sum total of what we have collected, of what we leave behind, um, whether we edit it or don't edit it. I think it's fascinating, the bits of us. And so um, I began to write the flashpoints, and I've got three here to read, and they correspond to the collages I made for this exhibition. Um, that's the first one, All White Things, which is really where I began, which is, if you like, a monochrome childhood. It's, it's everything I remember about being very little of light, of daisies, I'm sure... Possibly we all share that, or maybe because I'm much older, it's in black and white. I don't know. <laughs> um, and also, we moved from the country to London. And so the second flashpoint is very much about my memories of London. And those things are, those moments are a long way off, but they also are very near. Um, because the reasons that I choose the clothes that I wear today is because of then, and I think that's really interesting. It's not, I don't really believe it's, I don't make those choices quite simply because of what's in a magazine, but as, because of what I feel, because of what, what uplifts me for colors that actually I want to dress in. Um, so the second flash, well, the third flash point that I'm gonna read, but the second collage I made is Spain. And Spain was where I grew up, really every, every summer, and it, that, really, that really was a becoming. That was really where everything sensory came alive for me, in the heat, in the, in the blood, in the sea, in the sand of Spain. We lived in a ramshackle farmhouse. There was no electricity. There was no running water. It was the most fantastic, wild time where actually I learned about the taste of things, the smell of things. Um, it, and I think one of the reasons that 
I connected so deeply and profoundly with John Galliano was because we both shared that Spain. He was from Gibraltar. It was very strong in him. And actually, you know, the rhythm of the Spanish dance, that's something that reverberated through his collections. And I responded very much to his color palette, and I still do. And when I moved to Chanel, we have, where is it gone? Here which is very stormy, it's a black point in my life, but it's not entirely black, it's very emotional. It was the same weekend that I discovered that I was going to have to be divorced. It was the same weekend that I realized um, I was being written out of a contract at Dior. So Carl moved in and was very generous, and so I moved from John Galliano to Carl Lagerfeld at Chanel. And in a way, this became a black period. Not black in a sense of mourning, but black because in Carl's mono, more monochrome sensibility, um, he designs almost in X-ray as a theory, almost like a blueprint of engineering. And so color, pattern, the visceral, the guts, if you like, the, the raw emotion became much more controlled and refined. And so my clothes became, actually, that's John, but that's Chanel up there. Um, and I still do, at Chanel, wear principally black or white. So <laughs> that's the theory behind this project which is, I think, probably the most exciting thing I've ever embarked on in my life. Um, so I'm going to read you now three flashpoints. Um, and then I'd love, you know, for you to ask me questions. And it doesn't have to be about this. It can be about, you know, anything, fashion, anything. I'm happy to have a go at answering, although some things I won't answer. Right. So... All white things. Once there was a whiteness and an ache of swans flying overhead. I cleaved to that lightness, the reach of mute song. I collected white things, wool snarled on wire, stones, feathers. I wanted to fly. To stop me, my mother shut me up in a disused dog run with diamonds of wire which her geats would poke their beaks through. They nested on old milk bottles under the deadly nightshade. Land-bound, alarmist, imperious, they would hiss at me with the suddenness of snakes. I was sewn in by ghost static. If the swans could rescue me. I grew up in a cottage with a cat skeleton and a child's pair of boots bricked up in a chimney breast. Nights were full of cries. I began to realize that they were my own. My father would sit by my cot in the dark and tip capfuls of liquor into my mouth to drown me to sleep. But the days, oh, the days of my early childhood, green with growing and littered with daisies and Queen Anne's lace and dandelion clocks white as my father's hair. I was always heading for the light. I called my doll Daisy. She had rigid plastic limbs and carved nails. Her eyes were blue, and if you tipped her backwards, they would close unevenly. She never slept. I dressed her in my old clothes, all the cotton shrouds of babyhood. By the time we moved to London, I had a dressing-up box full of my mother's clothes. I would dress my brothers up in velvets and chiffon. We inhabited a mysterious otherness, but the heavy Ottoman wedding dress I reserved for myself. Its whiteness possessed the secret sacred transformation of all white things. So the second part of that is London, which is London 1970s. London. Footfalls on the pavement, hopscotch, chalking the squares, the stone clicking onto the sixth, elastics, clapping games, the smell of York stone and London clay and the leaf mould and gutter treasures of splintered taillights that I would collect with bottle glass to make tiaras for my dolls with Jasper. London. The lions and the gibbons being fed in the zoo before dawn. The flying Scotsman chugging and bellowing out of Euston. The cavalry on exercise. Hoof beats and the glossy backs of the horses led in threes 
by erect officers in khaki with flat caps, the greys, the bays, the chestnuts, and finally the lines of black horses. I would crane above the windowsill, holding onto the bars of my bedroom window on the fifth floor of 13 Regents Park Terrace. It was a world of miraculous pattern, threaded with the rhythms of the seasons. Christmas, carol singing with lanterns and tobogganing down Primrose Hill, power cuts and chestnuts on the fire, walks in the park, grey, bleak piles of rake leaves smoking in the fog, falling off the roundabout in the playground, the rag and bone man with his lame, dray and desolate cry. Easter egg hunts in gangs along the terraces. Space hopper battles and hobby horses and mama's plays. Bikes and football and being run over by a mini on my 10th birthday when I crossed the main road and forgot to look both ways in my exhilaration at being old enough to get the ball. The world was stilled and the woman sweeping her step stood open-mouthed in silent scream. I stood up. One of my sandals lay on the road. There was no birthday party that year. London. The plain trees peeling like old walls with their pom-pom seed balls. Clackers, jumping beans, stick insects let loose in the privet hedge. The treasure tree bloomed purple when we'd climb high enough to see Henley's garage and the convent with its mean grilled viewing slot where the nuns would receive messages. Treasure waited to be uncovered in cellars, at the bottom of lift shafts, in coal holes. London. Picnics on rough army blankets on doorsteps with the milk turning in the sun. Leapfrog and bike races through sprinklers. The sweet rot of Inverness Street Market and the lure of the Indian man's store. Fruit sellers, hawkers and street calls and the Irish dancing outside Routon House and inside the pubs. London. Fireworks and stuffing the guy and cooking potatoes in the warm grey ash the next day. And the leaves falling. And the third one is Spain. Spain was my summering. We lived in a farmhouse up a white stone track. We drew green water from a well. We grew hard and brown as almonds, washing off the salt from the sea in the mountain water, sluicing down the irrigation channels. We drew blood in the valley in gangs of children, speaking an instinctive language made up of ancient gestures and sounds. Stealing peaches, we cornered a wild boar. It chased us into the trees. We hung there in the heat, understanding the delicacy of the fruit and the regret of thieves. Feral children with bleached hair and scrambler bikes, sleeping to the sound of fig leaves falling like plates onto the stone courtyard. Unfamiliar stars became our map. We lived to a strange new rhythm, waking to the bells of the goat as they, cl they clambered up the hillside at dawn. The call to prayers from the golden minaret in the village Siesta heat, separating the strips of plastic in the baker's doorway, laden with the sticky spice of dulce and creme caramel. Nights under the kerosene lamps, swinging in the breeze as the grown-up's eyes glittered white with muscadet, and we raced into the crash and the grin of the black waves, our nakedness ghosted by phosphorescence. First love, and the scent of time up the track and his back arched over his motorbike as he acceler accelerated to make me catch hold of him hard and fast. The flare of the cicadas, the scent of white flowers, jasmine, gardenia, and flirting over the pinball machine in the bar with the greasy men in the huddle watching the bullfight on the TV high on a shelf. Spain was a becoming. The flash of the woman's gold tooth and her earring as she rode by to the fiesta, her dress running like water, down the horse's wet flanks, the turn of the heels in the sand and the staccato syncopated clapping of the dance. Blood in the water as the women fought one night on the beach. I climbed into the dark for the first time, into the blackness of red, into the animal and the human as animal. Time was suspended in intervals of light, but I learnt the pity and the vulnerability of shadows, the physical reality of the moment. So that's it.